Yo ladies, yo gentlemen, welcome back to understanding your openings. This is my second take of this video. The first one turned out to be a fail for technical reasons, but I'm actually glad that that happened because in the interim, um, I decided to change my mind and uh, I decided to put less uh, content into the video and more explanation than it originally was intended because I really want you to have a very good grasp of what's going on. And I really want you to get the most value from this video so that once you watch it, you really feel like I have actually equipped you with something that you can use rather than something that then you need to go and put a lot of work still into, which by the way, you probably will have to do in eventually, but at least uh, I'm hoping to give you here a very firm uh, foundation and skeleton of uh, what in my opinion would be an excellent choice against the main, main, main line Nimzo with E3. This move at first sight is very unassuming because it blocks in the bishop. But White's claim is that now he just wants to develop uh, very quickly uh, with the remaining minor pieces. And since black has no pawns in the center whatsoever, he's very likely to challenge it with one or the other or both. And so inevitably there will be changes uh, happening, exchanges in the center, which may open up the path of this bishop later on. Now, after e3, black has got castles d5 and c5 as the most common moves. Um, and very often they actually transpose into each other. However, for reasons that I'm about to explain to you very soon, I recommend you that we start off with c5. Um, and after c5, we are at an important uh, juncture where white can play bishop d3 or knight e2. I'm going to start with knight e2. This is a positional concept that is designed to retake on c3 with the knight and disallowing the double pawns. Against this, we are going to take, take and castle. The idea here is that after a3, instead of taking, we are going to come back with the bishop and uh, enjoy the fact that now the knight on e2 is really, really silly. And so what usually he tries to take the initiative by playing d5, aiming to play d6 and uh, try to make our bishop move several times, but that's actually okay for us and we do do that. Takes, takes and bishop c5 is my recommendation here. Rook e8 used to be an old main line with d6, bishop f8, g3, b6, bishop g2, knight c6, hair raising complications. But um, the computer actually proves this variation to be very messy and very often quite good for white. And so I opted for something that is far easier to understand and actually appears to be far more sound too, which is go back with the bishop to c5. Now, yes, we have played three bishop moves already. Bishop out, bishop back, bishop back out. And in fact, we'll play a fourth. But despite of all of this, because of the white king is so far away from castling, it still feels like black is ahead in development. Because whilst my queen side is terribly locked in and can't move, now the main issue is the king. The bishop is aiming down onto f2, which is very poorly defended. So on rainy days, queen b6 or even knight jumps might threaten. So now white needs to play very accurately too. Knight d4, d6, bishop e2, preempting any e-file dramas, a6. This move is designed to secure the bishop's retreat and to take away the b5 square from any white pieces. And now we just develop. Knight in, knight e5, rook e8. We have a lot of very natural, very good looking moves. Black is already doing really, really well. And now I'm going to actually show you a model game. And actually this is gonna be the structure of this whole entire video. And this is one of my greatest beliefs. And that is that the best way to learn an opening is to, as soon as the first time you see the opening, immediately back it up with a model game. Because then first time you see the opening, you first time see a fabulous game and you immediately make connections and it's far less likely that you are going to forget the opening if there is a game that you also remember that backs it up. And on that note, I would like to hear bust what I consider to be an absolutely awful myth. Uh, that I see on uh, Twitter and uh, social media an awful lot and it just makes my heart boil when people uh, make a comment about what part of the game do they prefer to study or what is less important and they say this absolute bonkers thing of I prefer to study middle games rather than openings and I'm like 
<clears throat> this is middle game right there for you. A middle game is a result of an opening. You can't play and learn middle game structures if you don't have the openings that lead to them. There is no, in modern chess, you can't separate opening from middle game. And for some reason, this actually stayed with us, this utterly false concept from like the 50s and 60s, 60s or I should rather say, from the writing gap of zero to a thousand, where it made a lot of sense to slice the game up into three fa fragments and uh, dedicate time to each of these segments. As soon as you hit 2000, there is no use whatsoever for you to separate opening from middle game, because if you don't study your opening in a way that that seamlessly flows into a middle game, then you're not studying your openings at all. Like this is where it actually starts. That's a middle game. So it just, yeah, blows my mind when people go like, no, nah, no, nah, stuff the openings, study middle games. So middle game of what? Like it's just appears miraculously out of nowhere. Makes no sense. No, study your openings, then lead that into the mid game. And so now we are actually studying openings whilst looking at a middle game that will then take us through a whole entirety of a game. That is, in my opinion, the ultimate way to learn and understand openings. H3, necessary move to prevent knight g4, rook e8. Note here a pile up. Players who are stronger than, I don't really like to always do this category, strong players here already would envision that once this knight moves, this exchange sack would have a lot of power to it because white would be utterly weak on the dark colored complex. And that's exactly what's going to happen in this fabulous game. Lotje Topalov, by the way. B4, bishop back, queen out, bishop d7, a4, rook c8. Look at this. Textbook development. Is it an opening? Oh, yeah, it is. Is it in a middle game? Yes, it is. Does it make any sense to separate them and study them separately? Not at all. This is how you study it. And from here on, we could call it a day here and go, black is doing fine. Or you can analyze further to see what kinds of plans you would then he come up with now that the whole entirety of the army has been mobilized. Rook c8, knight g6. Sorry, rook c1, knight g6. And tada, this is incoming baby. Rook d1 and bang. A really awesome exchange Saccharino that creates, like I said, lots of weak dark squares. A weak pawn here makes this bishop like a crazy strong man. Uh, looking down on the diagonal, it's like the best sniper ever. What's that dude called? Kylie. Kylie, what's his name? The American sniper. Bugger. Now, this guy puts that guy to shame. That's how good of a sniper this bishop is here. Uh, queen is seven, knight a two, takes, takes, and boom, shki. This is how good chess is played from a good opening into a well played middle game into fireworks. I probably sh should go through the game quickly because you will see how beautifully Topalov conducts the attack. Regularly doesn't take stuff that is hanging, but instead attacks more stuff, introducing this. Note how the black army is absolutely slaughtering white exclusively on the dark colored complex as a result of that exchange Saccharino. Bishop in, h5, no taking on g3, almost like sadistic. Look at this knight, can't go, can't go, can't go. And uh, goes on to win, I'm going through this very fast because this is really not opening study, but let's go back all the way. So how did we get here? So once again, against d3, we go c5, we take d4, we castle, and we drop back to e7. When d5 hits, we trade, and then we go back to c5. And from here on, it's natural development. d6, the knight comes here, the rook comes here, the knight goes in, bishop goes to d7, and black is doing splendidly well. That's it. So with that, we ticked off the knight e2 variation. Now the next step that we need to take is going to be the improved version of the knight e2 line, where they play bishop d3, we go knight c6, and they play knight e2, still insisting on not putting the knight here, but on e2 with the same idea of uh, being able to take back with the knight. Here, my suggestion is that we enter an IQP, a very common pawn structure, not in only in chess, but especially 
in uh, the E3 Nimzo Indian. And this is exactly why we are playing the Nimzo Indian, because as you can see, in the previous game, we had symmetrical pawn structure. Here we are going to have IQP. In the next game, we are going to have uh, another very flexible pawn structure. So we are exposed to a great variety of fun structures that all chess players should know. Knight takes castles, castles, bishop c2. And here you need to remember a weird looking move. And that weird looking move is bishop d6. The idea behind this move is that we want to combat queen d3 with the super annoying queen h4, which defends the mate threat and creates our own whilst floating this threat, which is also game winning because if we get a bishop for this knight, it's over. And so usually in this position, white needs to kick the bishop out, which we then retreat. But now what happens is that after queen d3, there is no mate threat down here. So that's a bit of a, an interesting win and lose because now we actually forcingly centralize the white knight, but we also clocked up the diagonal so that their attack is going to be less effective. Um, bishop e7, pawn a3, stock standard move to prevent knight b4, queen c7, queen d3, and rook d8. This is a really awesome move. A lot of club players are scared to play like this, uh, a move like this because they go like, oh, this looks scary. Well, it does, but scary, unfortunately, is not an objective chess evaluation. The objective chess evaluation is this. Is there a threat here or is there not? And the answer is there isn't one. Because if knight f6, we can take it with the knight and the knight defends the pawn. So rook d8 is totally fine. And now, in fact, we might even be threatening with something like knight b4. Takes, takes, and then we pick off this cherry on c2. So he goes now g5, making sure that now there is a threat down here because now it's three attacking it, g6. And we are in a traditional IQP, except that this knight is on e2 instead of f3. And that's the main game changer in this setup because what that means is that this knight can't really join the fray either on e5 or g5. It does allow a queen swing like that, but we can easily deal with this. And after a couple of moves, we can clearly see that the white army is just simply incapable of building up that usual pressure behind the isolated pawn that we are usually used to. And so here, the balance is going to tip very quickly to black's flavor like so. Bishop b3, h6, we're just pushing all the pieces back. And now we do our usual maneuver, b6, bishop b7, Knight f5. Once again, note how beautifully black is playing alongside those principles that I did discuss with you guys back in the IQP videos. Blockaded pawn, backed up by the, white, uh, the knight. And now, although we haven't managed to trade pieces, but it's simply because there wasn't an opportunity. But now it's very difficult for white to progress on without putting pieces in a, a tradable situation. Knight c3 and back instant take and now we are entering a third pawn structure type or fourth or fifth the hanging pawns especially if it gets pushed up which is also very typical in the nimzo and this from black's point of view is one pleasant structure to the next because they still are considered weaknesses in an endgame scenario so now we trade queens once again look at this it's the principle that is playing trade 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 it's not that top, uh, sorry, we are looking at uh, this time uh, Rogers against Ivanchuk. He's not winning this game because he's Ivanchuk the legend, but more so he's Ivanchuk the legend because he's doing what he's meant to. Trade queens, which more or less I would say was forced. If they played something like queen g3 here, I guess both knight f5, even b5, and potentially e5 break is even playable very very cool stuff so um yeah we are doing doing very well trade happened and from here on it's child's play for ivanchuk to win this end game with this beautiful white squared blockade bishop here bishop here is threatened so rogers again is trying to change the structure but this happens all in vain he pushes past now this bishop is really bad if this pawn gets blocked and in general, the fact that he managed to keep this pawn chain or other island together is fabulous. A lot of people, he would go like, oh, but this is a pass pawn. Yes. And it's a weak pawn as well. In fact, 
it's much more weak than past. F4, knight c4 back takes and white just collapsed and went on to lose. This is hanging, this is hanging. Um, yeah, Ivanchuk just did his magic. Yeah, excellently played. So here if rook b1, then obviously we take if rook b1 here, we take this. Um, there is no way out. It's just Gonski. And so this is my recommendation. And again, let's go all the way back against the bishop d3 line where we go knight c6, take on d4. After knight e2, we take d4 and we go d5. This is how we embark on the uh, IQP structure. Here comes the quirky bishop d6. Remember this move, very important because this is pretty much the only time in an IQP when the bishop stands well on d6. And again, the sole reason why this is good, remember again the motif, is because the knight is here and not here. With a knight on f3, this move would be an utter lemon because I wouldn't have queen h4. And so after queen d3, g6, this bishop g5 would hit me very hard. But now that's not doable. So they need to spend a move on kicking this out, which blocks up this diagonal. And we are all g now. Queen c7, rook d8. And just play the usual IQP as you would, and you will be fine. Textbook, textbook play, way to play. And that takes us to the next variation, which is, oopsie, I'm spoiling the party here big time. Yep, which is going to be, so e3, c5, bishop d3, knight c6. Doesn't really make a difference. They play this move order, but for the <coughs> sake of accuracy, I want to show you that knight c6 is our move order, and if knight f3, then d5 transposes into the game. So d5, knight f3, castles even, castles and knight c6. This is the ultimate main, 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 main line. One of the most fascinating variations in chess, full stop. And again, this goes to show uh, the ridiculous concept that I highlighted before, that opening theory actually starts here. That's the middle game. So you can't separate the two, forget that. It doesn't work, it never will. It's just, trust me on this one. If you want to study middle games, study openings. Um, so what happened? We castled and basically we just keep on uh, developing. And by the way, note that this is so typical Nimzo. At first, it looks like we do nothing for the center. And then look at the next five moves. Bang, center, bang, center, bang, center. And all of a sudden, I'm massively contesting this center. And only when they force me do I take. And now we achieve this highly flexible position where queen c7 takes takes leads to a more rigid structure for my liking at least. Whereas d takes c, bishop takes queen c7 with the idea of e5 is the most fun variation in my opinion that one can play. And this leads to an absolutely fascinating uh, equilibrium in the Nimzo where everything is in imbalance. And that creates a balance and that's awesome in chess. That's one of my favorite things. When you look at the board and nothing is matching up evenly. And despite of that, the position is very even. So what am I talking about? White has got this pawn mass that has quite a bit of potential in the center, but for the time being, it can't go. Black has got fewer pawns in the center, but they are mobile, right? White has got a, uh, seemingly less attractive development than black whose knights are perfectly placed the bishop is ready to go all pieces are on perfectly optically great squares but the long-term potential is with white because he has the two bishops so once these pawns or some of them disappear the two bishops will fire like mad and so all these little imbalances add up to a very complex hole that as is is quite equal or rather close to equal but depending on what I decide does it can very easily swing one way or the other I'm going to show you two main games um, to sort of make these motifs stick with you so e5 h3 b6 this move is based on the idea that the c4 bishop has departed back too soon and so now we can utilize these white weak squares rather quickly. Queen c2, 
Note that one of the most common ways how black loses this line is d5, this knight goes somewhere again at c4, bishop b2, and this dark squared bishop becomes uncontested and just an absolute sniper like before. I still don't remember the dude's name. It's so annoying. So b6, um, queen c2, Gelfand Korchnoi, by the way, is the game we are following. And he Korchnoi immediately homes in on the uh, weak white squares. Knight g5, bishop a6. And now the bishop is en route to bishop d3. Rook d1, rook e8. Um, I think on bishop d3, uh, yes, the exchange Saccharino is quite annoying. Take, 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 and then these pawns start rolling. It could be a problem. I quite like Korchnoi for actually preferring development and only going in when it's actually best. Note how he is also threatening to trap the knight now. So f3 was forced, and now we can go in. There, h6 takes, takes knight e4, and this is a very common theme in this variation, that white actually bleeds out on the weak white squares. Once again, it's a very unusual case that two knights beat the two bishops, but the c1 bishop is a tragedy and it can't ever join the game. C4, B5, a beautiful a ripper of a move. Uh, computer doesn't like it. That's the worst part of it. Instead, he promotes F5 or Knight B7 with the idea of Knight D6. Either way, you can see that black has a very firm grip, grip on the position, a blockade, thanks to Nimzovic and my system. Um, and so, without any dramas, he will go on to win uh, this game. Even this way, knight b3, take, take. And here, f5, followed by g4, would have created such an amazingly awesome mate attack. It's really, really cool. Takes, 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 knight f2. And a quick rook, uh, sorry, quick rook lift is going to cause white's downfall. Not to mention the fact that uh, there is a four carino here as well. So how did it happen again? So we go bishop takes. Actually, I'll go all the way back. So c5, d5. Knight c6, note that we start with knight c6, then d5, then castles, but we arrive in the same position. Takes, takes, queen c7, and this is where theory actually starts. There are lots of moves here for white, h3, bishop b2, rook e1, queen e2, bishop e2, 5 million of them. Like, this is where you actually need to start studying the position. But e5 is exclusively our only plan here, and then we can change the plans depending on how white reacts and for this reason i'm going to show you one more game in this topic and that will be um korobov topalov topalov's cam name comes up for the second time the dude when he was in his prime when he reached 2800 or very near to that he was one of the most fearful most dynamic most aggressive players in the world matching kasparov's uh, viciousness for initiative and attack and so in his hands the Nimzo was a brutal weapon again another different move order with which we can arrive in the same position and here instead of the previously seen bishop a2 we look at bishop b2 e5 comes down the less usually he take 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 results in a position where this bishop finds it difficult to come back into the game without shutting something in like i can go back and then hope to play c4 but by the time i get there black gets so many pieces out with tempos that it loses its power so it goes h3 this is usually played to prevent bishop g4 and also to restrict the bishop bishop f5 note again the weak white squares queen e2 rook d8 look at this beautiful development i always admire it when absolute top players just do the basics of the basics put your pieces out on good squares that's what it looks like that that's what it used to look like in morphe's time and that's what it looks like today in fact in my course development i do talk about this a lot that good looking development even into 2020 is the best way to play chess rookie one e4 so now black commits to closing off the position because he sees the opportunity <laughs> that he will be able to create some kingside play and still add nasty threats. Rook c1, knight e7. The engine prefers here knight a5. g5, 
keeping control of the white squares, but 97, in my opinion, is more human, eyeing, bo eyeing both of those squares. And f4 here is a terrible mistake. So again, white gets a little bit too excited about the opportunity, or rather, he doesn't want to allow a knight f5 when f4 is not possible anymore. So it's understandable that they played for this, but now after ef, rook f, again, you can't help but know that this pawn structure has become so wonky. Knight f5, knight g3 is a threat, as is knight e6, bishop back, knight in, knight e4, and out of nowhere, Black is totally winning strategically. White has got three pawn islands. The middle pawn island, again, is entirely blockaded. The two bishops are utterly useless, and white is planless. Take, take, 19, and rook e8. Again, perfect development. Look at this. Every single piece is on perfect squares, and on move 23, black is already winning. Against Korobov, who is 27, 15. Oopsie daisies. Bishop b1, b6, and I will spare you from the rest because it's a quite long game. Topalo went on to win without any dramas. So let's have a look again what happened here. So we go again for the take, 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 and then queen c7, e5. So this is again the, our tabia, our starting point on move 12. h3, and he just develops. Develops, closes the center, gains space, reroutes pieces to the right squares exploits weak white square on e4 wins chess game <laughs> done dusted and that ladies and gentlemen is going to be your guide to the e3 mainline nimzo indian i did it very differently from the previous two videos because i focused here on the games mostly because the theory behind these lines is so extensive that simply i can't squeeze them into videos like this but i do want you to have a sense of confidence that you understand what you are doing and I hope I achieved it by this video and in the next one I'm going to cover the f3 the queen c2 nimzos maybe the g3 as well I will see how we go but for the time being I will cut it short here thanks for watching I very much recommend you go through again uh, this video one more times or one or two more times just to make sure that you nail it and I will put these um, things into studies so that you will have access to that too thanks for watching Bye. <laughs>